on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. You're never going to have any horror stories to talk about by passing on a deal, right? That's right. But all it takes is one bad deal to slow you down from three or four really good deals. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. All right, everybody. I'm Chaz Wolf. I'm your host, Gathering the Kings. We're back. I've got Paul Larson on the King stage today. My brother, thank you for being here. How are you? I'm doing well, Chaz. How are you? I'm good, man. We were just kind of chatting offline about some really cool people you got to hang out with. I love getting with high level people and just doing cool stuff, especially when you get to do it for your future. And you were kind of, you were, you were tipping off a couple cool things that you guys might be doing with an island. So maybe we'll get to that, but tell me what kind of business that you're in. Tell me what you're doing, what kind of industry you're in, that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely, man. Totally honored to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Paul Larson out of uh, Spanish Fort, Alabama, and I am a commercial real estate investor. And what I focus on is multifamily cash flowing assets. So started buying real estate, small duplexes, quadplexes, you know, really love the, you know, putting the tenants in, creating the equity, creating the cash flow, then refinance, repeat, right? Yeah. And then we slowly moved from small two units, four units, 10 units to larger, you know, 20, 30 units at a time. And man, I would say about a year into it, I stumbled on a mobile home park. And I love the fact that I just own the land. So I had to kind of think about this and say, how, how does this work? I own the land, the tenants own the mobile homes. So I don't have to yeah. work on roofs, toilets, sheetrock, flooring, right? I just yeah. make sure I yeah. take care of the land. So I like that aspect of it to reduce the maintenance and just yeah. overall headache. And when you do that, you can scale much faster, right? You don't need a, so, so many people to scale kind of the way we did it. So it was a small park. It was 44 pads and yeah. loved it. A few months later, locked up another small RV park, which is a little bit different than a mobile home park, right? So these things yeah. have wheels. They come and go. And it's a different asset class. And what I decided to do was treat it more like a mobile home park and have more okay. longer term tenants. And sure. so in turn makes it easier. So did that, bought a few deals. And back in 2020, I met a phenomenal person that become my best friend and one of my business partners, Jeff Gua. And I met him doing stuff like this right here. I wanted to grow. We were yeah. growing and we wanted to learn, hey, how can we raise capital? We're having a lot of investors that want to come in and do deals with us. And we're like, man, we have sure. no idea how to raise capital, how to structure this and do it right. Why not, right. you know, pay to learn how to do it and figure out how the big boys are doing it. So my wife at the time bought a ticket to a commercial empire event. Tim Bratz puts that on and it was phenomenal. It changed the game for me. But while I was there, I met Jeff and we sat down and shared a sandwich. Long story short, we stayed in contact. Four or five months later, we bought our first deal together. Bought a five unit deal. And we're like, hey man, that was fun. Let's do another deal. We did a 48 unit deal. Hey, that was great. We still enjoy hanging out and doing deals. We did 125 yeah. unit and we did about 400 units last year together. So, you know, we were able to scale. We had the right people in the right place. We enjoyed the heck out of the whole ride. And, and now we're, you know, buying, RV parks and developing RV parks. So that's kind of the wow. asset that I've been sticking to, which is RV parks. Yeah, I love it. I love the backstory too of just, you know, strategic connections, events, friendship, you know, all those things play into to success. And it sounds like it has for you as well. I'm curious, before we get into some of the nuts and bolts of kind of how you've done and, and the scaling and, and teams and stuff like that, why? why? Why are you still pushing at this level after you've done 400 deals just last year, I mean, you don't need the quote unquote money at this point. Why are you still pushing? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'll tell you a little 
you know, backstory that got me to that point. So after high school, I tried college out, wasn't for me, just absolutely was bored, was bored in high school, literally took the books, put them in my locker and I passed without studying for one test, right? Just didn't enjoy school, just couldn't sit still. But what I did enjoy doing was making money. I enjoyed, you know, taking ideas and, and making something out of them. But I didn't quite hit my stride. So I decided to go into construction. So what, a lot of what my family did, blue collar. And I would say back in 2007, in December, I, I was 21 years old. I just bought a house. I just bought a car. And in January of 2008, I got laid off. I had no job, but I had a brand new car and a brand new house at 21 and very little money saved up. I had no idea what happened. And I haven't told that story a lot. And I feel like I probably should. But so out of desperation, I said, you know what? I don't want to work for a company that is going to hand me a paycheck. I'm dependent on that. I want to be able to produce what I feel is right for me and the way I want to do it. So I went right into sales. I had people say, man, you'd be great in sales. Why don't you get in sales? So I went to the financial industry. And I was lucky to get in there. I was against a lot of college graduates, a lot of people that was much smarter than me. But I had the entrepreneurial DNA. I, like, I would get up, I would go to work early, I would learn. I was a big sponge. I knew I didn't know it all, but I knew I could outwork the person to my left and to my right. And that's what I did. And I, I was blessed. I had a great couple of years there. And then I was headhunted by another company. And it was the car business. So they brought me in to sell cars. So I sold cars for like a year and it was an absolute grind. From that point, they, they brought me in as a, a sales manager. And then I was okay. recruited by another top. It was all high end dealerships, BMW, Jag, Land Rover, Cadillac. And then sure. I started going from dealership to dealership, building up their finance department, hiring and recruiting their salespeople, training them, teaching them how to close deals. I um, did that for several years. And out of nowhere, I got a text from a guy that was a COO of a real estate investment firm. And he, we had met before and we, we had a great time. We got to know each other and just chat and talked. And he seen something in me apparently and reached out when he made it big, a small company. And he was like, Hey man, I need some help growing this company, some help, you know, yeah. building out a sales team. And I said, okay, great. Talk to me. Yeah. Long story short, we got in there and man, just, it blew up, spent two years there, helped develop the company. He was phenomenal. The CEO and COO, they are doing tremendous now. We talk on the phone periodically, play golf together. And that's kind of how I got my start in real estate. And that was a okay. wholesale company. So we did wholesale and we flipped. And we, yeah. when I came on, they were doing three to five deals a month. When I left, we were knocking down about 40 deals a month. So wow. at the end of the day, I was like, still grinding my face off. And yep. my whole point was that I wanted to spend more time on my wife with my kids and make a lot of money and travel. I didn't want to pick and choose. Yeah. So I decided yeah. to venture out, leave on great terms and start my own company. And that's what I did. And yeah. I started learning about multifamily and the power of multifamily and how much faster you can scale by buying real estate. So when you say 400 units, it's really not that hard to buy 400 units in multifamily. You kind of right. get what you look for. And sure. as a matter of fact, I'm selling off small deals right now that are two and four units. I just posted them today and there's offers left and right. And the way I explained is, hey, we're taking some chips off the table and we're focusing on our 75 unit and up properties. Because I promise you, Chaz, it takes just as much effort to manage and operate a four unit as it does a 75 unit. Actually, it's less work on a 75 unit. There's a lot more money and juice for the squeeze. And you can put a yeah. phenomenal team together where people take pride in ownership and it creates a right. much better lifestyle. So yeah. you, I keep going because it's, it's easy. I love what I do and I feel like I'm living my true purpose. I feel like I, I actually don't have a ceiling anymore and sky's the limit. And I think for entrepreneurs, you know, that's something that if we can break that ceiling and yeah. everything is up to us and it's possible and we just keep going for more. Yeah, hundred percent. You, one thing that you kind of said in there too, which obviously goes into what you're saying as far as living your purpose is that you wanted freedom, like time freedom to be able to spend more time with your, you know, wife and kids and your family. What do you think that like looking at what you've been able to do? 
what's like the like first thing that pops into your brain around why you now have the freedom that you desired then? <clears throat> like, what so is it about your is, current situation now that allows flow, you to have the freedom? Cash flow. Ca cash flow. First of all, the thing about sales is you go. I always said it was you know, for lack of a better term, you go from hero to zero at the first of the month, every month, no matter what you did last month, now you have to acquire new, you know, clients, Yeah. which is fine, but that's transaction. Yeah. What we want is long-term generational wealth. That means that your property is going to, that rent will go into your bank account at the first of every month. And the more properties you have and that cash flow goes into that bank account every month, that is a cash flow standpoint that helps you live your lifestyle. You don't have to be on edge and go, oh my gosh, where's the next deal coming from? You can be in the moment with your wife and your kids or if you're on vacation or whatever you make, whatever you enjoy doing, right? You can yeah. be in the moment. So that's the cool thing about, you know, multifamily real estate. I would say the cash flow is what helps keep the lifestyle. Yeah, I love that. And, and I would even venture to say that, you know, specifically saying that most people who are listening to this podcast are, running some sort of a business, but they're, but they're still in the, in the, the setting up stage. They're still in the grind stage. They're still trying to develop systems and teams. Maybe they're in real estate, maybe they're not, but even if they aren't in real estate, there's lots of ways to invest in cash flowing real estate, specifically multifamily. And so for someone who's not in real estate, would you say to that person listening right now, while they're building their business, that they should also be developing cash flow for long term lifestyle? Or is there a certain point in their financial journey that they should? Should they should they close their business altogether and join you in, in multi like what, what do they do? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So I like that question because that's what I'll help people with all the time. Because I love to get in a room and talk with someone that really wants more, that really wants to grow. And I think we all start our businesses to for the end result, right? We right. want to have the lifestyle that we choose. And I think a lot of us run into a situation where it's not the residual cash flow, but there's nothing wrong with that. The first thing I recommend you do is to get educated before you invest in money into a real estate deal, before you invest money with a GP like me or anyone that, you know, raises money to take deals down, you need to get educated. You need to get in groups like this right? Your group, there's probably guys in your group right now that are high level entrepreneurs in the real estate asset class, right? And you can ask questions, you can grow with them, you can get a college education, you can get 10 years in the matter of six months, because a lot of guys, right. we've went through a ton of mistakes, a ton of problems, a ton of trying to pivot, and figure out what's best for us. And we can share those with each other and help that in particular person grow. So I say educate yourself first, read some books, Listen to some podcasts because this is not a get rich overnight thing. This is a yeah. get wealthy over a period of time, right? For, yeah. I would say, you know, education would be key. And that's probably why you enjoy education so much because that's the foundation of helping somebody grow. Yeah. And when people don't understand something, they hesitate to do, right? But as you educate yourself, you get more confidence and you're able to take shots that some people never take. And these little yeah. shots add up over time. So that's why I say it's not like a get rich overnight, but you know how quick this year goes by. Look, we're at now. We're halfway through the yeah. year, right? So yeah. if yep. you get that exactly. education up front and the people that you meet in masterminds and the people that you meet in groups like this, it's going to level you up. You're going to learn faster. And then you can make a solid, you know, smart decision on where you need to go. I, I would yeah. say that would probably be the first step. Would, would you say that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, obviously I'm a real estate a investor and, and we share so many just mindset things I can already tell, but would you say for the person who doesn't have any real estate investments, like, can they become wealthy? Absolutely. Outside of 100%. Okay. And so what is, why, why do you choose real estate then as opposed to the stock market or opposed to like all these other opportunities. Why, why is yep. real estate so close to the heart for you? <clears throat> because real estate one, anybody can understand real estate when we look at numbers, right? I don't knock crypto. I don't knock the stock market. I have money and a little bit of all of it because I diversify, sure. but yeah. my, my, most of my portfolio, 90% plus is in real estate. Why is that? It's because I can look at a property. I can look at a, let's say a 50 unit 
property. I can say, okay, this is the market rent. This is the lowest it will go in bad times. This is where market is right now. Where can we push it to? What are the at, what are the amenities at this property compared to the amenities in town? Like I can figure this out, right? And then yeah. I know that it doesn't matter if another apartment or park or self-storage property sells. They could sell for a dollar right next to me. It's not like a single family house, right? If that single family house, if, if 08 comes and these things start, you know, being sold off, then your value drops. That doesn't right. happen in commercial real estate, right? They're going to base that off of income producing. So if I say I have 50 units and I know I can get $1,000 a month minus my expenses, this is what this property is worth in good times and bad times, period. So it's a confidence thing, right? Yeah. It's a confidence thing. Again, if you understand and you know a product that well, then you feel good about, good about it. Also, there's a million other reasons, right? Tax benefits. I can appreciate my properties. I mean, I can make money by not paying a certain amount of taxes. We pay very little in taxes, quite honestly. Another thing is there's, you know, exit strategies. You know, if right. you want to sell down the road when the time is right, you can 1031 exchange your money. So let's say if you make a million dollar profit on your real estate, that most people, if they make a million bucks, pay 45% taxes, right? Yeah. I can take that million dollar profit and I can roll that into another deal. And now I can buy a $5 million project with that $1 million. Yeah. And it right. just goes on and on. It's a snowball effect. I, there's too many benefits to real estate to not, you know, take advantage of it. And again, you know, I'm not the smartest person and I've been able to figure it out. And I've also surrounded myself with the right people that sure. we put together on a team and we're able to do it over and over again. That's why yeah, it means I love too it. much to me. Is there's not a 90% drop. It like crypto, like look at the market, man, right? Real estate is up here. Everything else is down here. So, yeah. you know, when I look at these different, you know, aspects to an investment, real estate is always going to be at the top for me. Yeah. I, I love the passion that you're speaking with. I think that all entrepreneurs to a degree, once you find that lane, you just like, you just, you just hone in on the energy of, of passion, excitement. And, and I, exactly. and you can totally tell that it brings you life. So I, I love that perspective. Okay. So let's, let's go back in the journey a little bit and let's talk about some X's and O's. I want to know first, you kind of gave us the story of how you got started and like the, the, the mindset of why you wanted to do your own thing and the ceiling, a little bit of sales background, but was, was the sales unto then entrepreneurship with the, with the ceiling just that you described, was that simply because of money or was that the money and the freedom together? Or was one more important than the other for you back then? So, <clears throat> excuse me, money was more important at first, right? So you go from, you know, being laid off and a house and a car and no money in the bank. Money is like the first thing you think, you're thinking about. Got to eat. <laughs> make money. So, and then when I realized that, you know, sky's the limit in sales, as long as I provide value and I understand my product and I truly want to help someone, I can sell, right? It's right. just the way right. it is. If the product makes sense for the customer and it fits, that's a done deal. It's closed. So, right. you know. At first, it was money. Then it become time for you. Because in sales, you can make a lot of money. And I guess a lot of money is just, you know, an opinion. How much is a lot of money, right? Yeah, but I would say the, the, the top 1% makes $450,000 or more, right? And so if you're making that or more, you're, you're filthy rich. That's just the way it is. And money is not hard to make. Money is very easy to make. It's easy to multiply. But you have to have the right opportunity to do it. And it takes, it starts somewhere, right? So yeah, yeah. I would say first it was money, then it was, then it was time freedom because then my second kid was born. And so I left before he woke up and I came home and, you know, I used to have to drive home and have lunch and try to spend time. And I said, you know what, this is not good. So, so it just kind of all worked out because uh, when the real estate investment firm reached out to me, it was, it was like a perfect storm. Um, you know, so, so I kind of jumped on it. And, and then from there I realized, man, I'm still working a ton of hours. It, right. I know that I can do this. I have to take a shot and right now I have to take it. So I took it and thank goodness I did. And it's, it, it scaled past my wireless dreams to be quite honest with you. I'd be lying to you if I told you, I thought we'd be here this fast, yeah. but it worked out and I'm very thankful for that. Do you, do you think that 
you had real estate kind of like in the back of your mind. And so that way, when, when this opportunity popped in, it was like, boom, you took it. Or did you not even know much about it at that time? So uh, we owned a couple of rental properties, but we okay. didn't have the, we didn't have the best experience with them. So it wasn't like I had a burning sensation, but I knew after, you know, we did a commercial property. So to tell you a bit about my wife, we were in the restaurant industry for 10 years and we just sold three restaurants and a food truck catering business as of 2021. That was my wife. Yeah. My wife is Laotian. Her background, her, a lot of her family's own restaurants across the country. You know, my wife as a, you know, a, a little kid would cook in the, in the kitchen with mom and dad. So Wow. You know, we had some really successful restaurants and, you know, so, so that really, that really had us working a ton of hours, but one of the restaurants, we did a seller finance deal in like 2016. And the cool yeah. thing was, it was a triple net lease. And when I got a taste of that, I was like, wow, this is awesome. I have a triple net lease. The tenant pays for everything, insurance, expenses, mortgage payment, and I'm getting paid. Right. right. So right. that was several thousand dollars a month net profit on one deal. And I said, man, this is awesome. So <laughs> if that's a few grand on this little simple deal. If we get another one here, another one there. And that's when the money started making sense. The numbers started making sense for very little effort with the yeah. right process and system in place. And it's pretty incredible. Yeah. And, yeah. And so such I a think unique... that was a little bit of a, yeah, I think that was the, I think that's when I had a taste of that. And when the opportunity came, I was like, I got, I got to take this. Yeah. Okay. So I, I completely relate to that, but you, you've done a really good job here, Paul, of, of painting a picture of how little effort and how we can make gobs of money in real estate. But I want to flip the coin and I want you to tell me about like the, the, not the downside, but like usually in the show, I'm asking for like a bad decision or what was the struggle? Yeah. What what's what's the sticky that is just like, ah, you know? What's that for you right now in your, in your role? So I would say I don't necessarily, there's not a big sticky right now, but I went through a ton starting, you okay. know, I can yeah, give us that. that. I think that's a little bit more important. You know, at first we were flipping and buying properties and just over rehab, right? Not mm. needing to over rehab a property. You know, you got to really understand, you got to understand the market, right? Just because you want something to look really nice, you need to make sure you're in the right market which is a difference between quartz and from like a countertops, which is a right. difference between $1.50 flooring to $5 flooring. Yeah. So I've seen a lot of guys run into that. We ran into that a couple of times, just having so many projects going on and over overdoing it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think raising capital is important. You can lose a lot of sleep if you don't know how to do it because, you know, once you take someone's money, you it's, game, it's showtime, right? So yeah. getting all that stuff into play, I waited a, long, a lot longer to raise capital than I should have. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you can learn how to raise capital a lot faster. You don't have to spend two years trying to figure it out. You can right. you go, go, go to an event, learn from someone that's doing it, reach out to me, reach out to guys that are raising capital, take them down. Because you need to get in and do deals with people that are already doing them. So I would say, you know, don't stay on the sidelines, just hop into a deal with someone, put some money into a deal, offer some value, figure out how to joint venture. I didn't joint venture at first. I did, I did the lone wolf thing for a couple of years and I absolutely love to joint venture. I mean, it's like, it, it's the, it's the, yeah, it, it's been phenomenal the way we structure our deals to okay. where we're able to take deals down, bring in smart people. Sometimes we have two to three GPs on a deal. Everybody plays a role. So you play your role. I play my role. And mm -hmm. we, we do Zoom calls. We meet. We talk about everything. And we make sure we keep the project on, on, on timeline. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and that's more, it sounds like more of on a project basis as opposed to a long-term multiple project scenario. It's not like you're set up a long-term company. You just, you have yours, they have theirs, and it's project-based. Per, yeah, per deal. So you and I may, you know, take down a hundred unit deal, right? Uh, it might be in your backyard. So we may raise all the capital and say, hey, you know, we need your management team to manage this. We'll teach you guys how to operate this part. We'll raise the capital. We'll sign on the loan. Let's work out the project management side, right? So right. let's get you to oversee this. Let's do our call every week. Make sure we get this thing to the finish line and make it worth X. Take it to the finish line, cash out, refinance, pay investors money back, and then just move on to the next deal. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you're you're right. What really the the uh, the principle that joint venture really leads into, and this is maybe just a little plug for the for the listener here, 
as they're listening to you talk, it, it's the who, not how factor, right? Like the lone wolf says, how do I do this? Yep. The, the, joint victor, the joint venture perspective is who do I need to do this? And so that, I think that's also a, that's a super applicable in every single business. Obviously it's applicable in real estate, but, but in every single business, you have to get out of your own way and you can only get as big as you allow yourself to be, or until you start, you know, replicating or duplicating or, or going outside of yourself. That's so right. it's a, it's a huge principle. <laughs> okay. What, so would you, would you say that you know, not raising capital early enough or, you know, st doing things on your own were those, were those bad decisions or were those things that you just kind of like, just, it took you longer to understand and that you would have just done faster if you had to go back. Yeah, I, I would have done it faster. I, I don't think it was a bad decision. I learned a ton, you know, it made me a better sure. operator. You know, I mean, I worked right. a ton. I got more gray hair in my beard, obviously because of it, but it made me a much better operator. So I don't look at any, I don't regret any decision whatsoever, but I think those were some things that I could have done faster. Obviously, you know, the past couple of years show what you can do with the right people. And now, man, I look for ways to give equity away. I look for ways to bring people in, right? If I, and that all comes down to like when I network, right? I, I won't do it with Joe Blow that walks up and says, hey, I want to do this with you, right? We're going to have to know each other for a little while. We're going to have to connect, have some calls. I need to learn about you. You need to learn about me. And if things sound right, who knows in six months when a deal comes along, when, yep. when, when we're going to call on your name, whenever it's time to put it together. As long as there can be some value added and you're the right yeah. person for the seat, a lot of cool things can happen. Yeah. What What do you think? Was it just the history of, like, we've done this a couple of times now and this is really successful. What, what's given you the confidence that you just expressed mm -hmm. in, in being able to join venture so easily? Yeah. So what we did was we bought a roughly about 150 doors before I met my business partner, Jeff. And so we learned a ton together. And he had a, a phenomenal background working as an asset manager for a big REIT, managed about a half billion dollars in real estate. <clears throat> and he knew a ton about it, right? And so when we, when we linked up and we just enjoyed each other's background, we were, you know, we, we added a lot of value from a lot of different ways. I handle the project management, you know, he helps with the property management. We both bring deals to the table. We both raise 50-50 in capital. But the things that we do well, or some of like, he loves to look at spreadsheets. He loves to analyze the deal. I, it makes my sure. skin crawl. I can do it. <laughs> I do a great job, but I prefer not to do it, right? We can't be great right. at everything. So yeah. he does that. And then he says, all right, Paul, this is what we need to pay for it. And then I go to work. And then the rest is just teamwork all the way to the finish line. Yeah. I lo love the, uh, you know, get by your lane, clarify your lane, run fast. Mm hmm very good. Okay. So I, I want to ask you about, you know, we've kind of talked about good and bad decisions a little bit, some good things that, have, that you've chosen to do along the way, but is there a process that you follow? You've kind of identified the process a little bit now of like getting to know someone before you'd bring them in for a joint venture, but just in general, like disciplines that you have, or maybe even around making decisions inside the business that you follow some sort of a process in order to make continued good, good decisions. Yes, absolutely. I would say our buying criteria is key. Like we're going to have a buy box and if it doesn't check each box, guess what we do next? Right. Because we call, we, we do what's called kill the deal, right? We're going okay. to kill it. We're going to shoot as many holes in it as we possibly can. And if yep. we can't still kill it, then it's a deal. Now we'll raise okay. the capital. We'll sign the loan. We actually put our own money in each deal too, you know, and then we'll take it to the finish line. So the buy box, we buy in this population, in these markets, right? We're big in the Southeast. We're in Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama. We're moving into the Carolinas, Georgia. Um, you know, it's really great RV parks area as well. We love the Southeast yeah. because it's year round, right? It's year round. We have tenants year round. Yeah. Um, but I would say the buy box. And then if we check it all off, we're good to go. It reduces a lot of stress. It mit mitigates our risk completely. And we know as long as that deal fits our buy box that we created over the past few years, then yeah. we're good to go. Now we can confidently move on and close the deal. If it doesn't check the boxes, then we move on to the next deal. So without that, there's no other steps that are taken. And that yeah. is probably our number one process at that point. Do you feel like, I mean, because I, 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 the, the language that you've used, super familiar with, but for the person who, who's never heard buy box or criteria, decision-making criteria, they're listening right now. They're going, okay, this thing that I chose to do, it 
it, it fits, you know, I, I created four check boxes and it, and it matches three of the four. Let me, I'll, I, I could do it real easily or like, and, and they, they get excited about the opportunity, maybe for the revenue or for the sales. Cause they're trying to grow. They need the money. They're trying to, you know, make yes. payroll, all the, the different motivations of why to take the deal when maybe we mm -hmm. shouldn't take the deal or the next project or the next client, we can apply this to any business, right? What would you say to that person in that moment where they're, they know they probably shouldn't, but they, they feel like they have to. There's always another deal. <clears throat> there is always another deal. I promise you. I have a problem with it too, still to this day, because I'll get a little emotional about a deal, you know, but I learned to, to, to cut the emotions off. It's easy. You get it, you get involved, you get invested, you go through due diligence, you spend yeah. money, you spend time. And it's like, man, it, it, you know, it's almost just right, but I can promise you, you're never going to have any horror stories to talk about by passing on a deal, right? That's right. But all it takes is one bad deal to slow you down from three or four really good deals. Yeah. So I had a mentor tell me that if you buy a really bad deal, what it's going to do is slow down three to four deals you bought, right? So you want to measure backwards. You want to kind of say, okay, what is this going to happen? What is going to happen if I buy this deal? All right, so now I have a bad deal and I'm raising capital, right? So what do we have to do? If an investor goes, hey, have you ever lost on a deal? What am I going to have to say? Yeah, I have. And that's not cool. That's not good. Do we make mistakes? Yeah. Our deal is going to go south sometimes. Yeah. But that's why that buy box is there. Yeah. If you don't listen to that buy box, then you have to blame yourself for anything that goes wrong. So I would say don't put that, you know, don't, don't put that on yourself to have to try to make something work. Have that buy box, figure it out, understand what it is, and then just Make yourself be disciplined enough to wait for the next deal because there's always another deal. Yeah. Every it never fails. Even when we work on something for three and four months at a time and we have to let it go, there's always something right down the road, right around the corner. It happens almost every time. So yeah. that would be my advice. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Even from an outside of real estate perspective, you know, the the opportunity train, you know, comes by frequently. And, and you get so excited as an entrepreneur because you're that, that, that's what got you into business or real estate to begin with, because yeah. you didn't want the traditional thinking of nine to five or, or whatever you wanted freedom. You, you, you had, you're optimistic. You, 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 you want creativity. Like, so when the, you know, the opportunity train comes by and you start looking at these, these deals or, or businesses, uh, man, it's so hard sometimes to, to stay focused on what it is that's in front of you or what you've committed yourself to, because the possibility over here, right? The shiny object, you know? Absolutely. We're, we're all, we all know we've been there, you know, and it's going to happen again. You just have to exit and move on. Yeah. I think even because we both got a sales background, you can do the same thing in sales too, right? Like if, if you're hungry for a deal, or if you're desperate for a deal, the prospect knows it, right? You, they can, oh, they can sense it. Oh, they can yes, smell sir. it. They can sense it. They can sense yep. it. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, you know, it, you just got to have your buy box. And that's something I don't think enough people create as they're looking for deals. Yeah. You know, and yeah. if you want to be taken seriously by brokers, by sellers, off market, you have to have a buy box because eventually they'll get tired of send, sending you deals if you're not closing anything, right? right. So, it, you know, when my phone rings a broker or a seller or somebody, I want them to go, all right, this is Paul's number. He's, he wants to do a deal. This guy can do a deal. So yep. if we give them the right criteria, we can shoot that out. We can shoot that out to the masses and think about the lead gen that you'll get and you'll get what you're looking for, right? They're not going to send you something that doesn't fit your buy box. So it's a good way to clarify how you buy your deals and then start bringing some leads in and looking at deals and make some offers. Yeah. You have to make yeah. Offers. You said, you said it earlier in the call here. You said you get what you look for, right. which is so true in life, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Whether it's positivity <laughs> versus negativity, you're looking for family time. You're not looking for, I mean, you get what you look for, or even Absolutely. maybe a better way to say it is you get what you want, what you really want. That's right. <laughs> that is exactly right. Because we can say what we want, but if we don't, if we aren't doing the things that back up what it is that we say that we want, then we don't really want it. And so to your point, I think that if you can create the buy box, even inside of a business, a buy box for a client, a buy box for the next, you know, project the, for construction, whatever it is that fits these criteria. We do it. If it doesn't, we don't. And it's just cut and dry. It makes it super easy. And, and also too, even, even to the benefit of what you're saying, it, it seems as if you'd be cutting things off and cutting away opportunity 
but it actually opens you up to all of the things that you really were looking for to begin with because yep. you were clouded over here with all of the things that yep. really weren't a good fit. Yep. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So let me, let me hit the, uh, let me hit the uh, speed round here with you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to know, which you may, I might already know your answer on this one, but it, inside the business, if you could only pick one metric to track forever and ever, and that's the only thing that you could track, what would it be? Man. I mean, I buy for cash flow. I, I you know, I would say ARV after repair value. Okay. okay. So I'm going to buy a deal 55%. ARV, 55 cents on the dollar, right? So I don't have to run around and buy a hundred deals to make good money and live a good lifestyle. I just have to buy a few really good ones. Yeah. So I'd say ARV, you look okay. at what the project will be worth. You buy a hundred unit project or 50 or 10 units, whatever the case may be. Yeah. You, you run it on a 90% occupancy at a market rent with a certain vacancy. And what will that project be worth? So if it's worth 2 million bucks, I'm buying it for a little bit over a million. Yeah. It will never fail that way. Yeah. And I won't buy a deal every single every single month, but I buy three or four a year and they're big deals. And so that will put you leagues ahead of other people that are just scratching by on deals. And there's plenty of them. You have to look for them and you have to work to get them. So I would say ARV. And then after that, I mean, your buy boxes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's everything for us. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. All right, what book would you recommend that a six-figure owner or maybe someone who's newer in real estate, since we've kind of gone mostly real estate on this you know, conversation, should read? I'm going to say Who Not How by Dan Sullivan because, you know, that was a, that was a great book for me. It helped me understand, find the who, right, to get it done. Yeah. And it just, it really woke me up. It really showed me that, man, you got to get out of your way, Paul. You have to get out of your way and have other people leverage other people in a way to where we could all win and grow together and have so much more fun and scale at a much faster rate or as fast as you'd like. Who Not Hell by Dan Sullivan. Love that yeah. book. Incredible book. I read it not that long ago, actually, earlier this year, but probably time to read it again. But I, I reference it often, so that's, that's fantastic. I, I know the answer to this one already, but for the sake of the listener, do you network or mastermind with other entrepreneurs or real estate people? 100%. Just got back from Charleston, South Carolina last week. Part of Legacy Family, Tim Bratz, phenomenal guy, friend, and learned a ton from him the past couple of years. But yeah, I definitely got to network. You need to join a mastermind. You need to get in the right room. I mean, this is where, you know, the real deals get made. The real friendships are made the lifelong friendships, right? People that are really going to tell you how it is. And, you know, if you're, if you're in that room, you're going to learn tenfold. And just remember to, to add value. Don't go in there and try to take. Don't try to go in there and take, take. Even if you, even if you feel like you're the smallest guy or girl in the room, yeah. understand that we're all just people trying to grow and be better people, better fathers, husbands, wives, you know, so on and so forth, right? Business owners, so you get in these deep conversations and, you know, it's not these normal conversations that you have just walking down the street or having a breakfast or this and that, right? These are right. guys and girls that are at the top of their game, have worked very hard to get where they're at, and you're able to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and enjoy yourself. I mean, the knowledge you gain is, yeah. I mean, it's not measurable, really. Yeah. No, I, I love the perspective that you have. You said one thing that I want to just ask you a follow-up question to. How, how does one who maybe feels like, you know, the smallest person in the room, how does one like that add value so, in, in that, in that <laughs> setting, they get into the room, they're yeah. around other people. Oh, I'm the smallest guy in the room. What do I do? Yeah. yeah I would just be completely honest. And I would say, Chaz, you know, it, it's amazing to hear your story. I mean, man, I, I, my head is spinning just from, you know, hearing what you've done and how you built it. Quite honestly, man, I feel like the smallest person in this room. And I'm, I want to add value. I just don't feel like I can. Uh, but I am so open to, to hear you tell me what I can do to help. Whatever you think it is, man, I want to add value. So how can I add value to you or anybody in here? What's your recommendation? And let them help you figure that out because that's why you're there. You're there to grow. And trust me, you can add value. But I think if you ask, you will receive, right? If you're looking for it, you'll find it. And it just to be genuine, just be yourself. And when you're your genuine self, like the creative juices start flowing. 
you'll hear something. Yep. You'll be in there. You'll hear someone speak or you'll have a conversation with somebody that night. And all of a sudden your head will be on the pillow at the hotel. And you go, man, now I know what I can do. Now I know I can help. Now I know I can be a part of this. And yep. everybody starts somewhere. And just remember, be yourself, be genuine, and you know, keep that positive mindset and you'll add value left and right for it's over with. Yep. I love it. Thanks for the, the just phenomenal answer. Appreciate that. Last question. If you lost it all, Paul, what would you do? I'm getting right back in the real estate game. No questions asked. hundred percent. I mean, this is, this is where it's at, man. The do the same thing, same asset class, do all over again. Like what, like what would happen? The same yeah, I mean, multifam multifamily. I mean, I love multifamily. I love the asset. I mean, I probably would start looking at a hundred units before even looking at the duplexes and quadplexes. I would do that differently. I would do bigger deals faster. You know, it, I just, I'm so bought in on real estate investing. I understand it. It's the cash flow, right? It's awesome for your, your bank to fill up on the first of every month. And right. then it just does it again and again and again and again. Right. So you can buy, you know, a few deals or you can just keep going. It gives you options. Right. I would say I would, I'd buy bigger deals right off the bat. Yeah. Or I would get, and I, and I would, I would network. I would join masterminds. I wouldn't worry about how much it costs. I would figure out how to pay for it. I would yeah. sell my car and pay for a mastermind and ride the bus to work if I had to, to get in a yeah. room and learn because it's not about now. It's about the rest of your life. Right. Take advantage of the opportunity that you're given right now. There's so many beautiful things that will happen and you can achieve anything you want to achieve. And real estate is where I try to point people and help people. And, you know, it's, it's, it's changed my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just so appreciate the value that you've given. I <laughs> usually I find myself like interjecting and trying to pull out little nuggets, but man, You've, you've just delivered it up on a silver platter. I really just appreciate just your approach and just humility throughout the, throughout the show here. How, how can someone connect with you? They, they've really enjoyed everything that you've got. Maybe they want to invest with you. Maybe they just want to get to know you. How do they find you? Sure. Okay. So you can find me on Facebook at Paul Larson. That's P-A-U-L-L-A-R-S-O-N in Spanish for Alabama. Instagram is underscore Paul underscore Larson. I'm on, let's see, LinkedIn, Paul Larson. And I have a website, which is larsonrei.net. And then my email is paul at larsonrei.net. So you can catch me on any of those platforms. There you go. Again, Paul, thank you so much. So just curious to see, you know, as time unfolds, even, even where our connection goes, I'm just thankful to meet high quality people like you and, and uh, you never know. I, I, I do have a piece of land under contract right now in Kansas City. Maybe it needs an RV park on it. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, man, <laughs> let's talk. We, hey, we have good ideas. We'd love to hear about it. And I'm just honestly thrilled to be on, thankful to be on. And I, I do appreciate it, Chess. Yeah, brother. We wish you nothing but success. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing literally over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings literally exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.